Shabuot, to hear words and to prepare for Shabuot, Ken, the same way we are coming together tonight, the Azat Hashem, to prepare ourselves for our emotional return, reunion in our Mikdash Me'at, in the place of Tefillah and Torah. Tonight's event is dedicated to Nishmat, one of the great Mitpalalim, one of the great men of prayer in our community, Mr. Samuel Keslasi, Alava Shalom, who was Niftar just a few days ago. And while we are entering the realm of Tefillah in this world, <clears throat> we are joined above in the upper realms by the men of prayer, Anshe Emuna, <clears throat> and Keshem Shemak Dishim Oto Bishmem Arom, just like the Tzadikim in the upper realms are connecting and entering into the realm of Tefillah and the upper realm, so too in the lower realms of this world we are entering. <clears throat> I would like to begin the evening by saying a few words of my own, and then we will <clears throat> pass it on one rabbi at a time. The goal, Ba'azat Hashem, is to try to conclude the evening in one hour's time, God willing, more or less. It is written in the Gemara, Masechet Berachot, Darvav Amud Aleph. Says the Gemara, Tanya Ama bin Yamin Omer, Abba bin Yamin taught, En tefillah shel adam nishma'at, Ela bebet ha-keneset, that the tefillah of a person can only be heard in a bet ha-keneset. So says the Gemara. The tefillah of a person can only be heard completely by HaKadosh Baruch Hu in a Bet HaKeneset. The question is, Rabotai, what is with all the dozens, the hundreds of tefillot that we prayed in our homes, all of us, every day, three times a day, on Shabbat, four times a day, what is with all those tefillot? <clears throat> what will happen with all those tefillot? If the tefillot are only heard in a Bet HaKeneset, then what is with those tefillot? I want to share with you an unbelievable thing that I read that I'd like to share with you at this moment. It is written in a sefer that was written by one of the mekubalim of the Rishonim era called Sha'are Ora. He writes that what happens to the tefillot that we prayed in our home by ourselves outside our Beit Knesset? The answer is, he says, that when we return to our Bet HaKeneset, all the tefillot that we prayed in our home accompany us back into the Bet HaKeneset. They don't remain in the home. When we will return to our Bet HaKeneset, the tefillot that we had to pray be because we did not have a choice will return with us to the Bet HaKeneset. And so the Bet HaKeneset will be flooded with thousands and thousands of tefillot that had to be prayed outside the Bet HaKeneset. Rabotai, this is an unbelievable hisdamnut. When will we ever have an opportunity like this in our lifetimes to enter into a Bet HaKeneset where we will flood the Bet HaKeneset with thousands and thousands of tefillot? It's unbelievably emotional. I want to share with you a midrash that is written in a sefer called <clears throat> Agadat Eliyahu. It is written like this. The pasuk says in the book of Echa, Tishtapechna Abne Abne Kodesh Berosh Kol Chutzot. We say in the fourth chapter of Echa, Tishtapechna Avnei Kodesh, Berosh Kol Chutzot. The holy stones poured Berosh Kol Chutzot at every intersection at the time of the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Says the Midrash, this Midrash is brought in Agadat Eliyahu, says the Midrash that at the moment that the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took those stones and they shattered, and they flew to every end of the world, 
and every place that there would be a synagogue until Mashiach will come will be a place where one of those stones, one of those shards of the stone of the Beit HaMikdash will be situated. It is not just by, has, by haphazard that we build our synagogues where we have them, but there is a shard of the Abanim of the Beit HaMikdash that flew at the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and planted itself in this place. And it is in that way that we consider every bit HaKeneset as a Mikdash Me'at. This is why it is called a Mikdash Me'at, a small miniature Beit HaMikdash. Why? Because it has a stone of the Beit HaMikdash. This is what the Beit HaKeneset is, Rabotai. While we are in the Beit HaKeneset, it is difficult for us to appreciate, like everything in life, that is, this is the nature of the human being, that it is hard for us to appreciate what we have until it is no longer there, or it is no longer there for a while. And so, in the next 24 hours, we have to start thinking about what this Beit HaKeneset is. What does it mean, Amikdash Me'at? That we have a piece of the Beit HaMikdash, Mamash, as it says in the Midrash, from the Beit HaMikdash, in each one of our Batei Knesiyot. And as we said before, when we will finally enter into this Beit HaKeneset, all of the Tefilot that we did not have an opportunity to pray in the Beit HaKeneset will accompany us. And I want to end off, just to be true to the 10-minute allotment given to each rabbi, 10 to 12, with one more Gemaran Masechet Berachot, it is written in Masechet Berachot like this. It is written that Rabbi Yose, the great Tanna Rabbi Yose, once prayed in a hurba. He prayed once in a decrepit home, a home that was falling apart. And it is written over there that Eliyahu Hanabi came to greet him. And Eliyahu Hanabi asked Rabbi Yose, What did you hear when you were in the hurba? So he said, I heard the following. Listen to this, my dear friends. Shama'ati bat kol shemenahemet b'sha'a she Yisrael Sorry. He said like this. I heard bat kol shemenahemet kayona ve'omeret oi labanim she'ba'abonotehem v'charafti et beti v'sarafti et echali v'yigletim leben ha'umot. Rabbi Yose said, I overheard the voice of HaKadosh Baruch Hu crying, crying over the fact that he destroyed the Beit HaMikdash and he exiled us everywhere in the far-reaching places of earth. The Amarli says the Gemara that Eliyahu HaNavi said to Rabbi Yose, Hayecha, I swear, he says, Eliyahu said this to Rabbi Yose, Lo sha'azo belvad omeret kach. It is not just now that Hashem is saying so. Three times a day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says the same thing. And not only that, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that any time that we enter into our Batei Knesset and we say, Amen, Yehe Shemeh Rabba Mevarach, we answer to a Kaddish. What happens at that moment, says the, says the Gemara, HaKadosh Baruch Hu mena'ne'a rosho. HaKadosh Baruch Hu nods his head. Ve'omer and he says, Rashre ha-melech, fortunate is the king, shemekallesin oto bebeto. Who has the privilege of having his servants praise him in his home, in his palace. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Malo le'av, and unfortunate is the father, Shehiglaid Banav, they had to exile his children, the Oilahem Lebanim Shegalu Me'al Shulchanabihem, and woe is to the children that had to be exiled from the table of their father. This is what it says in the Gemara. And so, in a certain way, if we consider our Bet Hamikdash Me'at to be a miniature Bet Hamikdash, during the weeks that we were away from the Beit HaMikdash and HaKadosh Baruch Hu could not hear that sweet sound of Amen Yehe Shemeh Rabbah. Perhaps HaKadosh Baruch Hu lamented in a smaller way the fact that he had to, he had in his infinite wisdom, had to ask us to leave for a little while. But at that, at, for the same token, we now have the opportunity to go back and to once again pronounce Amen Yehe Shemeh Rabbah Mevarach this will give HaKadosh Baruch Hu some nahat, 
Just like Rabbi Yosef said, this gives HaKadosh Baruch Hu some nachat. I want to tell you, Rabotai, that I believe, in my humble, small opinion, that it is an unbelievable hisdamnut, that we have an unbelievable opportunity, just like it is written in Halakha, that the day of Rosh Hashanah, that the fact that it's the first day of the year, the fact that it's the beginning, it is the Rosh, it has the ability to control everything that will happen in the coming year. And that is why we are asked on Rosh Hashanah to conduct ourselves in the best possible way. I believe that this for us is a sort of Rosh Hashanah. It is the beginning. The way we conduct ourselves, that first Shabbat, that first Tefillah in the, the Beit HaKneset, that first Amen Yeheshemeh Rabbah, that first opportunity that I have to be answering Kadosh, 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 that will dictate everything that will come afterwards. And at the same time, it's a tremendous, tremendous Hizdamnut. It is a time that I believe that the Sha'are Shamayim will be open for tefillah. It is a good omen. It is, go it is going to be a good omen, a good time for us to express our innermost uh, 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 yearnings to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and ex uh, express our heartfelt tefillot to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for everything that is important to us. Yehi ratzon, tekubal berachamim uvratzon et tefillatenu, that may HaKadosh Baruch Hu open up the Sha'are Shamayim at the opening at this time that is very, very mesugal for tremendous things. We should be zoche to enter into the Mikdash Me'at and then from there to enter Ba'azat Hashem Bekarov bimherab yamenu into the great Bet HaMikdash with the coming of Mashiach Sitkenu at this time, I'm going to invite our dear friend Rabbi Zrihan, who's joining us from who's joining us from uh, Los Angeles. We take the opportunity to wish him a heartfelt besim mantob on the occasion of the engagement of his son, his son Hayim Zrihan Bezat Hashem in Los Angeles. Bezat Hashem, he should always be uh, to to travel for Simachot Bezat Hashem. I don't know, Rabbi Zrian, are you unmuted? No, you're not unmuted. Are you unmuted? Do you hear me? Do you hear me now? Now I hear you, but I don't see you. Okay, now you see me. <clears throat> now you see me? Now I see you, yes. Je commence. Good uh, afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much, Rabbi Uziel, for your beautiful brachot, your beautiful words of Chizuk. Like Rabbi Uziel said before, is now basically a Rosh Hashanah for us. After a few months being rejected from the Batechnes Yot, Batem Midrashot, the Korelim, now Baruch Hashem, we're going to have the opportunity to go back to to the Beta Knesset, we have to come with a new preparation, a new resolutions. Before uh, um, I want to share with you a Gemara, a Gemara that it says the importance of the Filabet Sibur to say the Filabet Minyan. Um, I'm trying just to mehazek, trying to encourage everybody. Uh, many people. The, Many people they had the reaction of basically looking forward back to go back to the Beta Knesset. However, many they got very comfortable. You know, they don't have to run for Minha, they don't have to run for Arvid. You know, they can pray Shachrit whenever they want. And I decided to speak about the importance of the Filabet Sibur, the Filabet Minyan. And it says the Gemara a beautiful thing. Um, it brings the Gemara a story between Rav Nachman and Rabbi Yitzchak. Says the Gemara, Rabbi Yitzchak says to Rabbi Nachman, hello, how are you? I miss you this morning in the Beit Knesset. I miss you in the show, in, in, in the Tefillah. Rav Nachman answered back to him. He says, Amar I couldn't come. I was busy. I couldn't come. It says Rabbi Yitzchak to him, Amar lekan ulkan felemar asara. We seem, we seem to have frozen. He answered back to him, 
אמר לטרחה לי מיתר. It was a big, too much bother to ask to nine people to come together to my house to make minyan for me. I didn't want it to disturb. At least it says, at least, did you ask to the Shaliyah Tzibur to let you know when is the time of tefillah? At least you should pray together, Yoshmona Yisre, together at the same time of the Shaliyah Tzibur. And he says, no. Amar le kulehai, and he says, It's so important to go to Philavet Sibur. Rav Nachman says to Rav Yitzchak, why don't all these questions? Yes, it's so important that I have to go to Philavet Sibur. He answered back to him. He says, you don't know the Gemara. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Mishum Rabbi Shom Ben Yochai. Ma'i dikhtiv v'ani tevereti lecha Hashem Etratzom. What is the Pshat and the Pasuk? My tefillah is at moment of Etratzom. We say this, this tefillah every mincha of Shabbat. There is a certain moment of tefillah that Hashem is a et ratzon, is a time of ratzon Hashem, that Hashem, He accept our tefillot. Says, Ematai et ratzon, says the, 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 the Rabbi Shomon Yochai, when is the et ratzon? Besha'a shatzibur mitpaleli. He says, he answered back to him, to, 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 Rabbi, to, Rabbi, to Rabbi Nachman, you want to know when is et ratzon, when is the time of the ratzon Hashem, the will of Hashem, to accept the tefillah is when the tzibur, they pray together. You see from this small story of the Gemara, Masechet Berachot, Davchet, over there brings this Gemara, that one Rav, one Emora, he was questioning the other Emora, where you were for tefillah at tzibur? I don't understand, how come you were not here? Okay, I understand you, you couldn't do it, you couldn't do it, at least you, you gather a minyan. You couldn't gather a minyan, he says, at least there's an Allah Shukhan Aruch Sunnah will share with you that at least when somebody he cannot pray in the in the in the tzibur with the minyan, at least you should try to aim for the same time to pray together the Shmona Isra with the tzibur. And the reason, my friends, because if you want your tefillah to be accepted, or you want the 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 time, the correct time of the will of Hashem is Besha Shatzibur Mipalelim Biyachar. And then the Gemara says. Another small thing before I go, and it says, "Amar Akalosh Baruch Hu, Kol Osek Batora, Ubekimul Chasadim, Umit Paleli Matzibur." Anybody that basically he learns Torah, and as well is he do he does Chesed, Umit Paleli Matzibur, and he spring with Matzibur, Male Ani Alav Kilu Pedani Li VeLevni. As considered that is a kilu. This person he redeem Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and as well he redeem his children. And we see again the um, and, and we see here again the power of basically when somebody is busy with the, the Torah, busy with Chesed, and as well Filah Betzibur, Hashem is considered that he redeem him from Umot Olam. And another Gemara, my friends, and he says Resh Lakish. אמר יש לקיש, כל מי שיש לו בית הכנסת בעירו, ולא נכנס שם להתפלל, נקרא שכן רע. anybody that has a בית הכנסת in his, in, 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 his, in his town, and he doesn't go to pray, is considered a שכן רע, a, 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 bad, a, bad, a bad neighbor. Yes, and I will finish, I will, actually, I will do just another Gemara, and I want to go into the Alakha. And it brings the Gemara another interesting thing. They came, a few people from Babel, they came to Rabbi Yohanan. And they say, we, Rabbi Yohanan, we were in Babel, in Iraq, in Babylonia, and we saw a lot of old people. We saw, we went and met a lot of people. And the Pasuk says, In order to have long life, he says, normally, we have to, we have to be in Eretz Israel. When a person, he, he does the mitzvot uh, in Eretz Israel, he has a certain arichut yamim. And therefore, they were here questioning to Rabbi Hanan, what's going on in Babel? There is a lot of old, old people. He says the Gemara, he was a bit shocked. He was a bit shocked. And then they said to him, you know what? But these people, they have zechut of arichut yamim, because what? Says the Gemara, because the mekadme u mechashech elevene kenishta. These people, they, they, get, they rise early, and they go and they pray into the Beit HaKneset. Says Rabbi Yochanan, if so, that is the zechut, that is the segula of arichut yamim. Therefore, my dear friends, we see from here 
the importance, the importance of the Filavet Sibur. Number one, it gives you Arichut Yamim. Number, number two, like the Gemara says, if you have a Betachneset in your city and you don't go, you, need, you are considered a, 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 a bad neighbor. And the other Gemara says that when a person is busy with Torah, like, like all of you, and Kibiru Hasadim, but you have a bit of, of uh, atzlut, a bit of maybe laziness to go to the beta, to the beta, to the beta Knesset, to beta Knesset, yes, and, and if you go, is considered a Kosh who will redeem you, you and your children from the from the Galut. And as well, like we saw from the story of Rabbi Bitzhak and Rahman, what is considered etratzon? When is considered that Hashem is basically accepting all our tefillot? All of us, we have different challenges. All of us, we have different different inyanim, and we pray to Hashem. If you want to be guaranteed Hashem Barach to your tefillah to be answered. Says the Gemara, "Vani tefilati lachesh maratzon." When is the ratzon? Is when you say tefilah betzibur. And I want just to say another quick halacha, another quick halacha, important halacha, my friends. So important to say tefilah betzibur. Shohan Aruch on your on, on Or Haim, the Siman Tzadik, Siman ninety, Siman ninety, says halacha tezayin is seventeen. Aulech baderech vegiya laair. If somebody is traveling and is getting to a city and he wants to sleep, if a person is, let's say, far away, four milim is more or less uh, between 18 to 24 minutes. If you have a distance between 18 to 24 minutes and you can have a betagneset near you to be able to pray, Says Yeshua Aruch, even though that you were traveling all this time, you have an obligation to go to pray, to go that extra time, that extra 18, uh, uh, extra 24 minutes to make the fila betzibur. You see Yeshua Aruch as well, he says it's so important that even though you had a long day, you were traveling, you might think it's enough, you know, I am exempt. Says Yeshua Aruch, no, you have to go you have to make the effort. If you know there is a minyan, you have to make the effort to make the filah betzibur. As we see from here, my dear friends, the power of the filah betzibur. With Baruch Hashem, has the Hashem it Barach, for many years, many of us, we took it for granted to have this minyanim. Baruch Hashem, many people I see, they have minyanim in the offices. Yes? Um, but this, this magifah, this pandemic, that we were forced, many of us, to pray beyachid. It was a very hard, very hard for many of us. But again, I say, could be enticing. Many people, and I do believe, I do believe, many people told me, you know what, Rabbi, Rabbi, now I took my time to pray. I took my time to say korbanot. Every, I, I, Baruch Hashem was a big chizuk in the Avodah Tfilah. But we cannot forget that the halacha and the Ait Ratzon, the, the time of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when he's accepting what the filot is, when we're coming together, I just want to finish with one, one small story. Many, some of my people in my Beta Knesset, they heard the story, but I want just to say, what is the, the power of the filah betzibur? Says the Gemara that, that Akadosh Baruch Hu, when you pray by yourself, basically, is when now when you when when you let's say when you are crossing the borders, they screen you one by one. You know you can travel, maybe a family of five people. Basically, they see one by one. I mean the passports open open your windows and they screen one by one. And sometimes they say no, this one is legal, this one is not legal. But when you have the filah bet sibur, when you are, you come together as ten people, automatically Akados Baruch he, he says Baruch Haba, Baruch Haba. He, he's basically he, he says. At Sibur comes, Beruchim Abayim, all the Tefillah is accepted. I just want to finish with a small story that happened to me many years ago. When I was younger, for, uh, for, for when I was younger, I went with a, a group of friends. We went together from Tijuana, we crossed the border to, to America, to San Diego. We spent two, three days. Then I realized that I was missing some papers to get back into Mexico. And I didn't want to worry my father, my mother. I kept quiet. 
but I was worried, you know, how I'm going to get back into the, into Mexico if I don't have this this this, this passport. But basically, no passport it was like a a document to go and to to go back. I didn't knew what to do. He came back after four days. It was time to go back to home. I said to everybody, everybody give me the passport. We were like eight friends together. So everyone give me the passport. When we came to the border to Mexico, I took the eight passports together. We were nine people, but this, uh, we were nine people with the eight passports. I said to the to the officer, we have eight Mexicans coming back home. Yes. And I showed this stack of passports together. And I said, Yala, move, move. There is no time. We're going to miss the bus. Let's go. And I, I went by myself with them. That means when they saw the officer, the officer, eight passports, he didn't count eight, nine people. When we come as a group, yeah, when you come as a group, normally there are more lenient. You know, when you have a demonstration, somebody saying uh, one thing, one, one man, big deal. When you have 10 people, you know, there's already something what to hear. We have to be in police, we have to, to control. Therefore, my dear friends, the idea of the Philabet Sibur is when we come together at Sibur, Hashem sees one group and it says Baruch Habarat Fila. And automatically, it is the Etrat song. Be'ezat Hashem in Barach. We hope to be back in our Batak Nesiot. It's not going to be, it's not going to be easy. We have to keep social distancing, many, many details and alachot, Be'ezat Hashem Barach. But as long as we come to set the Fila, Bore Olam, will accept all our tefillot be'ezat Hashem in Barach. Shabbat Shalom Umburach. Thank you so much, Rabbi Zrihan, for your beautiful words. Baruch Tihye, once again, Mazal Tov, Besiman Tov to you and to your family, Be'ezat Hashem. You should always travel for Simachot. Sano Ibuano, you should come back, Be'ezat Hashem, very, very good. Enjoy your Shabbat there. Thank you, th thank you very much. Shabbat Shalom. Now it is a big kabod uh, to invite uh, Rav uh, Ovadia Habusha, from Kultura Congregation to please uh, share a few words of Hizuk with us, Bechabot. Hold on, Rabbi, we can't hear you yet. One second, I'm sorry. Bye bye. Okay, I think we're good now. So before I begin, I would like to uh, express my Hakarata Tov to the Rabbanim. We've been working together the last few days, uh, working out different protocols and a um, a way to approach our coming back to the Batei Knesiot, to Batei Midrashot. So Chazaku Baruch to offer all the hours that were put into this and the organizing of this uh, this evening as well. It should be a big zechut for the entire Kehila, the Kehilot of Toronto. Uh, amen, amen, amen. You know that um, when a space shuttle comes back uh, after a, a long journey, it has to attempt a re-entry. And a re-entry is the most dangerous, the most crucial part of that, of that voyage. Every decision has to be weighed. Every decision will have tremendous impact on the entire crew. It's a moment of deen. It's a moment of great scrutiny. There isn't room for error. We as a community have been forced out of our batekinesiot, of our synagogues. If you notice, the Svaradi Rabbanim are avoiding the word shul. It's much easier to say shul. Just that people say, oh, shul, what's shul? So let's say it once and for all. Shul is rashe tevot shibehu vehodu lishmo. Three Sephardic words, Shibehu vehodu lishmo, a place that we will praise and give thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name. So it's a very nice word, shul, which represents the Batekinesiot, Ubate Midrashot. But either way, we have left, we have been forced out of our, of our Batekinesiot, Bate Midrashot, and we have been uh, robbed of that opportunity. We, 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 we haven't had that chance, and we are uh, attempting our re-entry in, uh, in less than 24 hours. A critical moment indeed. The decisions that we make tonight as we prepare for this re-entry will affect the entire crew, will affect the entire kehila, entire kehilot, and not just for this Shabbat, but for many Shabbatot to come. 
The decisions we take tonight as a group, as a kihila, will have a great impact on what we will look like in years to come. And let me explain what I mean. Hopefully we all have an idea of what a Beta Knesset is supposed to look like. Whether it is that we grew up with traditional Beta Knesset, with traditional synagogues, where prayer was the focus, whether we didn't have that merit, but we earned that merit later on in life. And hopefully we attached ourselves to people who put great importance in tefillah and in prayer. So we have a notion that a Beta Knesset is a place of prayer. And the irony is that for that prayer, we need people. And when there are people, as we, we have been suffering for the last three months, people are social beings. And automatically, you put people together in a room, it's inevitable that there will be some crossing of lines of removing some of that kedusha. So what exactly is it that a synagogue is a place of prayer, yet it's a place of Knesset, it's a place where people gather together. How do those two ideas come together? And I think the answer is very simple. It's true, we need each other, and we need each other to pray. And therefore, our connection in a synagogue, in a Beta Knesset, is primarily being able to sing together, to pray together, to praise together, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And when I do it together with others, it's different than when I do it alone. I can sing Shira Shirim alone. I can sing a Tehillim alone. But when something is said in unison with an entire Kehillah, there is no question that that praise, I'm sure to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is great, but to us here is also a much greater experience. So if that's what a shul is supposed to look like, it's a gathering of people that come together to give thanks and give praise to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for being healthy, for having spared us from so much suffering that many have had to gone through, have to have, have, to have had gone through. And to be able to come back to a Beta Knesset to give the thanks, if that's what a Beta Knesset is supposed to look like, so then let's go to the next step. The next step is that each one of us chose to speak about a different topic, a different idea, an area that requires attention. It's an area that is an area perhaps of challenge to some of us, to all of us. And we're here to each person. It's true that some of our titles, it says rabbi in front of the name, but it doesn't change the fact that we're all uh, subject to the same challenges. Every one of us has the same challenges. Some people maybe have worked hard on it and it looks easy, but I don't believe that it's automatic. I believe each one of us has the same challenges that, uh, that are on the list of topics for tonight. Now you may notice that we did not choose a topic uh, that was the topic of kiddush clubs. Uh, Baruch Hashem in our Kehilot, we don't have that magifa, that plague, of Kiddush clubs. It's not something that we really need to address. And anyway, after being away from shul for 13 weeks, I don't know who in their right mind is going to be leaving the Haftarah in the middle of Tefillah after 30, 13 weeks. I can't imagine. And if there was such a notion, and maybe some do have this idea, I'm sure, I am sure that after such a long break, this practice would be reassessed and the appreciation of the full service, the full package of tefillah will be taken advantage of. So it really doesn't need to be addressed. We've, we've talked about things, we're, we're going to be talking about things that are hopefully more, more relevant to most people in the Beta Knesset. I shared with some of you in the past something that I had heard that Rabbi Oziel had shared with me, Rabbi Yosef, in the name of Rabbi Elephant, of the, the greatest test that Abraham Avinu uh, underwent, and he had, was, was, to his understanding, was told to sacrifice his son, his only, his, his only son, his beloved son from Sarah Imenu. And he takes the initiative and he, uh, he, he answers the call, he goes, and he's told to go to, 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 go to, the, to Moria after three days. He, he sees the place 
He tells the youths that are with him. Eliezer, Ishmael, Shevu lachem po hamor. Stay here with the hamor, with the donkeys. Va'ani v'hanar ne'lecha'at ko. But I will go with the son, with the lad, with Yitzhak. V'nishtachavir v'nashuva alechem. Now the Midrash has what to say about this expression, Shevu na'im hamor. Stay with the hamor. The Maharal expre- explains <clears throat> the hamor is a donkey. But what it really means, in its deeper sense, is homriyut. Homriyut means anything that is physical, physicality, things that will remove a person from spirituality. That is homriyut. You have ruhaniyut and homriyut. You have spirituality and that which is a barrier, a distraction from spirituality, and that is called the homriyut. Abraham is addressing these lads and saying, the youths, and saying, I'm about to embark on a life-changing mission. I'm going to scale the mountain. I'm going to go to Hara Moriah. I'm going to do the most difficult thing that a human being will ever be asked to do, and that is to sacrifice his son. And I hope to achieve this. And the way he tells this to, to Ishmael and to Eliezer, for me to be successful in this spiritual endeavor, I need the humriyut, the hamor, that which is physical, that which is earthly. I need that to remain over here. Because to achieve this greatness in spirituality, I need a place, I need to carve a space that is devoid of any distractions. I can't have that donkey with me. Leave it here. He was telling Ishmael, Park the Hamor, park the donkey here. Leave him in the parking lot. I'm going up to the Beta Knesset. I'm going up to the place of spirituality. Rabotai, that is the call that we, we have tonight. The call to us is to, although some people, you know, the government was talking about allowing us to have minyanim in parking lots, it never took effect. Rabotai, the call to us is to leave the cell phones to leave the smartphones in the parking lot. Leave it, park them, leave them in your cars. Some of the Betekinesiot have taken the initiative to have boxes to put away those cell phones, to put away those smartphones. Park them, remove them. Because if we want to take advantage of a spiritual experience and not be robbed of that experience, don't take that which is uh, distracting from that very spiritual experience called tefillah. Keep it someplace someplace else. Keep it someplace far. Don't bring it to the Bet HaKnesset. Many leave the, leave the phone at home in the morning. What do they need it for? What exactly are they so connected to that they have to check before shaharit? Which Shulchan Aruch, by the way, tells us, don't do these personal things before shaharit. Now, Shulchan Aruch can be looked at as rules and regulations, or it can be looked at a, at a holistic perspective it is the way that we regulate ourselves and not be enslaved by our very selves. When the halakha says, don't do things that are personal before you pray, it's a way of saying, don't be a slave to yourself. Realize that there are much more important things. There's no obligation to bring your phone to shul. Leave it at home. If you need for whatever reason to bring it home, to bring it to shul, leave it in the car, leave it in the cubby, leave it in your coat. Don't leave it on the table. Don't leave it on your stender. Don't leave it on your table in front of you. What's the point of that? Is that going to increase your tefillah? Very, very unlikely. Now, of course, someone might say, but Rabbi, yet with the times, my phone is not just a phone. It's a sidur as well. Yes, I understand that. But Baruch Hashem, our synagogues have many sidurim. And our sidurim in the Batekinesiot in our synagogues have an added feature that all notifications are off. No one gets a notification from his regular printed Sidur when he's in the middle of the Amidah. But other phones do. And you may say, I turned them off. I don't know what happened. These are all ways that the Satan gets into our minds and feels that we need this phone. We need this mechanism in order to pray better. And it's a fallacy. It's absolutely false. 
you don't need a phone for tefillah. You might need it on vacation, I need to know the direction, you're stuck. Those are all the exceptions. I know the exceptions. But here we're talking, tonight is not the night of exceptions. Rabotai, tonight is the, is the night of the rule, the, the night of normal, regular tefillah, be'ez of Hashem, that we should be zocheh soon. It's not about the exceptions. In normalized tefillah, a phone has no place in the Beit HaKeneset. It has no place on ourselves. Leave it away. I've said it enough, enough times. I think, I think we're just going over the same idea. Imagine in the old days. Imagine in the old days, uh, your father, your mother, they see you coming to Bet Knesset. What do you have in your hands? I have a stack of envelopes, stack of envelopes, and a letter opener. Say, my dear, where are you going? What do you mean? I'm going to shul. He says, really, you're going to shul. What are you doing in shul? What do you mean? I'm going to go check my mail. I'm going to open my mail. He's going to go to shul to check his mail. <laughs> you, you go home. You check your mail at home. You go to shul to pray. Imagine a person, and this is his brother. He's coming to shul. He has newspapers under his arm. He says, my dear son, where are you going? He says, what do you mean? I'm going to shul. He says, really, what are you doing there? I'm going to check the news. I'm going to check Arut Sheva. I'm going to check Haaretz. I'm going to check Yeshiva World News. I'm going to check the news. In the Bet HaKneset, you're out of your mind. Unfortunately, Rabotai, we have all been taken by this subtle Yetzer Hara that comes and says, I'm going to check my mail. But it, well, what's the big deal? I'm just checking my mail. I'm just checking the headlines. Rabotai, people are showing each other movies in Bet Knesset. Now, of course, we know what those movies are. They're not movies. They're blurbs. They're, they're small clips. Very cute. Sometimes they're religiously related. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they have no place in the Bet Knesset. We have lost that sensitivity. This is our time, Rabotai, to re-enter. And our re-entry decisions will affect not just us, but our children and our communities in the near future and for the future to come. Rabotai, this is the time, this is the evening that we can make decisions and say, I am not bringing my, my phone to the Beta Knesset. If I am, I'm putting it away, I'm turning it off. You know, vibrate, and silent mode doesn't help anybody. It's the same distraction. Whether it's silent or not, it's still a distraction, Rabotai. It's such an easy move to make when we're focused. Otherwise, it looks like I won't be able to do it. But it could be done, Rabotai. Tonight is the night to do it as we get ready for the Takeneset. Make the commitment. The Rabbanim have asked me to speak on their behalf, to say that we as well are making the same commitment, not to be talking on our phones, in the Beit HaKeneset, during the Tefillah. Of course, we can also have the great excuses of saying it's an emergency, someone needs an answer, it's, it's a halachic matter. None of that. The Beit HaKeneset is a Beit HaKeneset. If that needs to be done, it'll be done outside of the Beit HaKeneset. Things are urgent outside of the Beit HaKeneset. That's where those things belong. Let us create that space that Abraham Avinu says, park the Hamor here, a space of spirituality, a space that is clear of, dis of, of distractions, and I'm sure HaKadosh Baruch Hu will see those decisions and he will be proud of us. And I don't know if he'll say, I can't speak for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what he'll say. Everybody has their interpretation and plays God. My feeling is he will say, I'm proud of you all. You learned something amazing from this experience. I hope it never happens again. And if you take the right decision, it will never happen again. The Beit HaKaneset will be a space that is protected. It'll be our space of protection. I'm sorry I went over my time. My apologies to everybody. And I hope that we make the right decisions and we come back to our Bete Kenesiot, Bete Midrashot, healthy and sound. Amen Amen. I wish you all Shabbat Shalom and Mevorach. Thank you, Baruch Rechabusha. On behalf of everybody, you are forgiven for going over your allotted time. You live Shalem, no problem at all. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Hazak Baruch, thank you very, very much for your most inspiring and heartfelt words. It's now our kabod to ask Rabbi David Kadosh from Abir Yaakov Congregation. <clears throat> to address the Kahal Kadosh uh, on this uh, amazing, amazing night of unity, the Chavod Rabbi Kadosh. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Are we good? Amazing. Beautiful words of Eichabusha. Hard to follow that one. That was unbelievable. And uh, I hope that we all get the necessary chizuk to, uh, to enter Bet Knesset in the, without the cell phone, of course. Good evening, everyone. 
the topic of my short class today is COVID Rosh in the Bet Knesset. No, COVID Rosh is not the second wave of COVID-19. It has nothing to do with COVID-19. In fact, COVID-19 might be the exact reason why we lack COVID Rosh. So right now, many of you are wondering, what in the world is COVID Rosh? The phrase COVID Rosh comes from the first Mishnah in the fifth chapter of Masechet Berachot, which begins, En omdin lehitpalel ela mitoch COVID Rosh, that one should not rise to pray other than with a heavy head. Kaved is heavy, Rosh is head, other than a heavy head. What is a heavy head? A euphemism for an attitude of awe and reverence. The Mishnah then proceeds to say, Chasidim Marishonim, Hayushoin Sha'a Echat Umit Palelin, Kedei Sheyechavenu Libam Lavihem Shebashamayim. That the early pious ones would tarry for one hour and then pray in order that they may direct their hearts to their Father in heaven. But this just isn't some sound advice by the words of the Tanaim in the Mishnah. This was codified in Shulchan Aruch 93.2, which writes that a person should not stand to pray except with awe and submission. A person should not stand to pray in the midst of laughter or lightheartedness or meaningless words, and not from anger, but rather from joy. The Gemara brings countless examples from Hana, the mother of Shemuel Navi. David Melech and many of the Amoraim in the time of the Gemara who practiced this method of preparation. The theme of Koved Rosh Rabotai is putting oneself in the proper mindset to pray day in and day out, knowing that every single time that we enter the Bet Knesset, we enter the chambers of Akadosh Baruch Hu. Every time that we put our feet together, we stand before Melech Malchei HaMelachim. Rav Chaim of Brisk was known to say that not only is there the typical kavana that one needs to have, the kavana being concentrating on the meaning of the words, but there's a different kavana which is defined as standing before the king. When a person prays, he needs to think in his mind that he stands in front of God and he speaks to him. Reading words from a book or from memory without being cognizant of the fact that one is standing before God does not qualify as prayer. We are commanded to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu with one's heart as we say in the Shema, Ul Avdo Bechol Levavchem. Clearly, one does not serve with his heart just by reading words. There has to be an emotional investment. And this is done by contemplating God's presence and connecting with Him. Kavana, by definition, one must see himself as standing in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in order to be considered praying. Otherwise, he's just reading words. It's for this reason that we begin the Amidah by stepping forward three paces, as though entering the King's presence. And after our prayer, we retreat three steps, taking leave of the Shekhinah, taking leave of the Divine Presence. In fact, the Gemara in Masechet Yoma establishes that if one does not take three steps back after the Tefillah, it would have been preferable for him not to have prayed to begin with. A shocking statement from the Gemara. How can that be? I didn't take three steps back. You're nullifying my entire prayer. The answer is because if one doesn't respectfully step back, as if he would after a private audience with the king, then this demonstrates that he didn't even stand in front of the Almighty to begin with when he prayed. If one truly prayed with this awareness that he was Omed, Lifne Melech Malchea Melachim, he was standing before Kadosh Baruch Hu, he would have not ended his meeting so abruptly. The tzaddikim pray with such keen awareness of God's presence before them during tefillah that they have this striking appearance as they pray. The Torah tells us in Sefer Bereshit that when the Rivka came to marry Yitzchak and saw him for the first time, the Torah describes Yitzchak as he was in the middle of praying. 
Vayetze Yitzchak Lasuach Basadeh, upon beholding the sight of the great Sadiq, Rivka was so overwhelmed by this sight that she fell off the camel that she was riding. The Netziv comments and said that that sight of Rivka on Yitzchak at that moment left a lasting impression upon the Rivka that affected the way she perceived him throughout her life. And it's for that reason that Rivka never demanded Yitzchak banish Esav just like Sarah demanded that Abraham banish Ishmael. She had such reverence for her husband as a result of that initial encounter that she was unable to approach him to tell him what to do. A story is told about the, of the grandfather of Rav Moshe Feinstein, who had a job working for a certain non-Jewish man. And it was agreed under contract that he would take some time off from work in the afternoon to pray Minha. Rabbi Feinstein prayed the Amida slowly with intense concentration, and the employer suspected that he was taking a long time in his prayer out of laziness. He was avoiding having to work. Let me just take my time. He doesn't know the difference. One day, he tested the rabbi by shooting a bullet just over the head while he prayed his Amida. The rabbi did not budge. He was so cognizant of God's presence in front of him that he didn't even notice a bullet whizzing over his head. The employer immediately realized that he was sincere and allowed him to take all the time he needed to pray. But Rabotai, it seems that we have a very long way to go to achieve any level of COVID rosh. What is happening around the Batei Knesset nowadays is miles off compared to these early pious ones who were preparing for an hour prior to tefillah. Today, a large portion of the synagogue attendees come well over an hour or even an hour and a half late to tefillah. They arrive at their seat, beli busha, without embarrassment. They open a sidur and within five minutes, they're caught up. Unbelievable. What took the kahal over an hour to read and sing with melody and kavana is done by people in the blink of an eye. No realization that that meeting with God began 90 minutes ago and you showed up late. Every single week, ask yourself if such a thing would ever take place in your workplace. Who would survive their job if they came 90 minutes or 60 minutes late every single day? The pious ones came an hour prior to the tefillah. Unbelievable to pray with Kovid Rosh, to put themselves in the proper mindset. And we come an hour late with sleepy face, upset that the minyan isn't further ahead along, because that means it's just more time for me to spend in the Bet Knesset. I wasn't expecting that. I expected you guys to be at Ahavat Olam, and you guys are still at Ishtabach. What's going on over here? You guys are slow. They're complaining. These are actual comments that people have said to me. And they come an hour late to the Bet Knesset. Unbelievable. Today, our Bet Knesset experiences of those who would rather not look at the Sidur, but rather at synagogue bulletins or smartphones, like Rav Ovadia said, or reading other material because tefillah is not at the top of their totem pole. Where's the mindset? What's going on? through their thoughts when we sit in our holy sanctuaries. You know, in the last two months, we've lost two men that really exemplified what it means to take tefillah seriously. And there's no doubt that going back to Bet Knesset won't be the same. I would be remiss not to mention Mr. Soli Levi Zichrono Livracha, who personified the meaning of precision, of accuracy, and perfection in the tefillah. Every syllable needed to be perfect because tefillah had to be perfect. There's just no other way to pray. And he would frown upon the people that would rush through tefillah. He didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to him where he came from. He knew the importance of it and he made known to everybody else as well 
Why simple? Because you're standing in front of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and you have to have the proper mindset. And of course, you know, tonight's event is in memory of our dear friend and member, Mr. Samuel Keslasi, Zichronoli Vracha. Let me tell you something about the Niftar, everybody. In my synagogue, I pray during the weekday when I'm not at school at 6.45 in the morning. Every day, the Niftar would arrive at 7.30 in the morning. But he wasn't 45 minutes late to our minyan. He was 30 minutes early to the next minyan. Eight o'clock is when the next minyan start. And he arrived at 7.30 with his brother, may he live and be well, and others. He walked in with a suit, with a shirt and a tie. He put on his tehalit, he put on his tefillin, he sat and he waited. He put himself in the mindset to pray. And when it was time to begin, he began. He was the first. He was always the first. He is the prime example of what it means. The early pious ones would prepare themselves for an hour, knowing that they needed to do that to have the proper kavanah to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Every word of that korbanot in the morning was melody. But for us, Korbanot? What's Korbanot? What's that? I can start Baruch Shamar and I'm okay. I don't need to come at Korbanot. Baruch Shamar, you're actually doing well. Some people, they come much, much later. It might be difficult for us to concentrate on the words throughout prayer. Sometimes the words are foreign to us. They have difficult meanings. Baruch Hashem, we have good English Shidurim. But we must, at the very, very least, recognize the fact that at those moments of tefillah, we are speaking directly to the King of Kings. This awareness will have a profound impact on the experience and upon our entire attitude towards prayer. And it will help us avoid distractions and concentrate more fully on the lofty act in which we are engaged. Let us work on our synagogue experience let us work on our mindset. Let us work on our COVID Ros, the awe and reverence that we display towards the Bet Knesset, its tefillah and Akados Paruchu. And it starts with the preparation. It starts with the punctuality and the persistence. And Bezat Hashem, we will reap the rewards of our tefillot. Amen, Ken Yihiratzon. I just want to add before I uh, to conclude that this Motzei Shabbat. Uh, we will be conducting a Zoom Mishmara of the late uh, Samuel Keslasi. Uh, the, the rabbis of each synagogue will send that out to their respective members, and we hope everybody can join this coming Motzei Shabbat at 10.15 p.m. Bezrat Hashem. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Rabbi Kadosh, for those beautiful and passionate words. They definitely penetrated. Bezrat Hashem, we hope that the impact will be lasting. Hazaku Baruch. Thank you. And now, Aharon Aharon Habib, it is our pleasure to call uh, Rabbi Mesut uh, Azulai, Rabbi of Magen David Congregation, who will, Bezat Hashem, conclude the, the evening with, uh, with a topic after which uh, we will make a certain document available. You will look at your chat, which we will disable very soon, and uh, we will make this document um, available shortly. Rabbi uh, Azulai Bechavud. Good evening, everyone. Hazaku Baruch to all of you for coming out once again. This is really unbelievable, an amazing show of unity. Hazaku Baruch to all the Rabbanim. Each one was mamash unbelievable. Rabbi David, Hazaku Baruch, such powerful words. May your words, just like they came from your heart, they may enter all of our hearts to improve and continue to grow in the ways of Hashem and improving our tefillah b'shrat Hashem. So it's already 9.33. And uh, the event was supposed to end at 9.30. Um, well, with no one after me, maybe that means I have no time limit. We'll see what happens. You know, I got, uh, when discussing the uh, topics, they gave me talking in shul. I guess uh, one of the harder ones. So let's see what happens, Bezrat Hashem. You know, in truth, there's a lot of, t a lot of talking happens in shul. And you know what? 
maybe I'm last. It's okay to say this now, or you already heard most of the events. You can't cut me off. Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of talking in shul. You know, talking in shul is actually why shuls are created. Every single shul in the world is because of talking in shul. We want talking in shul. You know, the topic on the flyer is talking in shul. Someone said, Rabbi, shouldn't there be not talking in shul? I said, no, talk in shul. The question is, who are you talking to? If you're talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's what it's all about. But if you're talking to your friend, your neighbor, the guy you haven't seen in a while, wait for the Kiddush to do the talking. Not in shul, not during the tefillah. It's Knesset is a place, is Hashem's home. You're invited to the king's palace and you're pleading your case and you're asking Hashem, please, I have this situation, I need parnasah. And then all of a sudden, you look at your smartphone or you talk to your friend beside you. Imagine being in court, pleading to the judge and then getting a phone call and there's actually a true story that happened with a wealthy man that every Monday night would have a lineup of people outside of his house asking for money, Anim. He would always have his rabbi beside him, this man, because everybody that would come would tell them the story and the rabbi would sometimes help this rich man decide how much to give, etc. His method eventually became he would give everybody $20, but he would also hear their story. And at the end of the story, he would ask everyone to please write down their address. After the story, after the person went away, that address had two destinations. Either it went to his pocket or to the trash can. His pocket meant he was going to eventually send another check in the mail, usually something much larger to cover the person's needs. And the story goes one day, a man walks in, and he really poured his heart out. And really, from the bottom of his heart, was in such a tough situation. This rich man was about to cry as the rabbi there saw, he saw the whole story. And he said, here's $20. Please, write down your address. Right when he was about to write, still in dialogue, this poor man got a phone call. Hello? He answers the phone call. In the shock of the rich guy there. It took the, the whole wind out of this wealthy man. The rabbi could see on his face, like, did you really just do that? Unfortunately, that person's address ended up in the trash can. Now, does it mean that his sob story was fake? Was this guy a liar? He wasn't a liar. It was all true. It was 100% true. But if you didn't show respect, then you know, I'm sorry. It's just, you take the whole Cheshire Academy, I have a whole lineup here. It just doesn't work like that. I'm sorry. I know it's true and I believe you. It just doesn't work like that. And imagine us in synagogue and we're asking and we want to talk to Hashem and we need, and then we interrupt to talk to our friends, something so futile. What is Hashem going to do to our tefillah? Or even worse, your friend is praying. You don't know what he's, what's going on in his house. You don't know what, ne what needs he has. You don't know what he's going through. And then you tap him on the shoulder and you engage in a conversation. He doesn't want to say no, whatever, and he gets into it. There goes his tefillah as well. You know, this topic is very touchy. Not talking in shul. There can be, I think, two approaches to it. There's the tough approach where in our books of Chachamim, it doesn't lack the tough Korea, as they say, for talking in shul. And then there's the positive approach, recognizing the greatness of tefillah, recognizing what you're missing out on, recognizing that if you speak, you're losing gems and diamonds and opportunities. My usual self is to be a little bit light. Today we're going to go hard line. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. We're going to keep it, we're going to keep it light. But we're going to try, Bezrat Hashem, to show an appreciation of the tefillah. 
So then when we come back and we re-enter the stratosphere of earth, of Bet Knesset, we'll come back with something new. The zechuyot of every tefillah is something immense. To every tefillah, Baruch She'amar, Psuke De Zimra, Yishtabach, Yotzer Or, Shema, Di Amida, Alen Lushabach, everything. The Chachamim talk about it and rant how great it is. In the Shulchan Aruch Siman Nun Vav, Nora Chaim, the, the Shulchan Aruch writes, a person's supposed to run to hear and to answer Amen for Kaddish. The Gemara Masechet Shabbat, Kuf Yutet Amudbet says, if one says Amen Yehesh Shemer Abah with his full strength, it can remove Gezerot, very bad decrees that are on a person. Listening to Kriyat Torah without talking is the reenactment of the giving of the Torah at Har Sinai. And when you're listening to it, at Matan Torah, Ani Hashem Rofecha, everybody was healed. Asegula for Refua is there being attentive at the Sefer Torah. Who wants to talk then? Chazarat Hashat, the repetition of the Amida, according to the Arizal, is the Ikar Shabbat Tefillah, is the main part of the Tefillah. The Ketoret, which we know now so how great it is, has the Zechut and the Segula to get rid of plagues. The Gemara Masech Berachot of Dalar Amudbet says, when you say Ashrei Yashvavetecha three times a day, you can assure that you are a person, a Ben Olam Abba. The list goes on and on. And we know it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu literally gives us privileges upon privileges. An amazing toolbox that we can access Beracha and Shefa and everything that we need. We just have to do it. And then we talk. And then we throw it out the window. And even when you have a personal matter, we know that we, you pray for it and you put in so much effort. But then you talk, you're ruining it. Hashem's just going to not listen. You're not showing respect to it. The story goes with the great rabbi, Rabbi Friend. One of the great rabbis in the yeshiva at Neri Israel in Baltimore. The story goes that he was asked to speak in front of a great Hasidic rabbi and his students. And upon going there, he told his children, you know, I'm going to go meet with this great rabbi. Please, write down on a piece of paper, what do you want? What should I ask him for? And then he caught himself. And he said, before he called one of his kids, he caught himself and he says, hold on a second. I know it's so great to go to the great rabbi and to give him the names, etc. But Hashem gives us the opportunity to speak to him every single day, three times a day. And therefore, we have to make that a priority and recognize how great of a zechut we have. Speaking to Hashem three times a day, a private meeting. Rabotai Hashem gave us the gift of prayer. Let's take advantage of it. I want to ensure you, I understand the struggle of not talking in shul. If you know me, I love to schmooze. I love to talk. I love to enjoy. I love to enjoy and hearing the history of everyone. So how do we tackle this in a practical way? How do we get there? How do we do it? I think one of the keys is having our priorities right. When we come to shul, we have to turn on the mode, as Shlomo Melech says, there's a, et, there's a time for this and there's a time for that. We have to go into shul saying, what am I supposed to be doing right now? It's a time for tefillah. It's a time for connecting to Hashem, talking to Hashem, opening up your heart to Him. What do I do when I go to work? It's a time to work, not to play video games, not to do anything else. It's a time to work. What do I do when, I have, when I'm at home? It's a time for your kids. It's a time for your wife. What do I do when I go to a shiur? It's a time to sleep. I mean, it's a time to listen. That was a joke. I did that on purpose. Just catching you, seeing if you're, if you're following. There's a time for everything. We have to make sure that when we come into the Beit Knesset, it's a time for prayer. Let's get our priorities right. Imagine how we look. Imagine someone praying. And this happens all the time. But imagine you're looking afterwards at a video camera and you see a person praying. 
Now someone walks in. Your friend is, ah, I came late. And he comes with his kids. So you go to his kids, he picks up, ah, and his little two-year-old, you hear the Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. You're in the middle of talking to Hashem. Shabbat Shalom. And then your other friend, hey, como esta? How are you? Long time no see. And then they just started. They are funny. Come on. You, you just put in a word here and this. How is that to feel that how choppy it is? We're laughing because we know that it happens to all of us. We have to be in the zone. We have to set our priorities straight. Recognize where I am and what I'm supposed to be doing when I'm there. The Zohar Kadosh says, every tefillah, Kadosh Baruch Hu takes it and makes a crown out of it for himself. We have to ask ourselves, is my tefillah going to be there? I want my tefillah to be there. You know, we're living through very peculiar times. Even Haman HaRasha couldn't close down synagogues. As Esther Malka says, Go gather B'nai Israel, And they fasted and they prayed. They were in synagogue still. Kadosh Baruch Hu sent us out of synagogue for so long. We don't know why. But how we're going to come back is up to us. There must be a difference. It must be real. It must be practical. We must come back as a different person. The virus spreads by mouth, respiratory. Yes, Lashon Hara is spoken by the mouth, but here we had the mouth coupled with outside of synagogue. And when you put those two together, COVID-19 is kavod for the 19, for the 19 berachot in the Amidah. I don't think there's something clear. Everyone's talking about it. Our great Gedolim, it's not just here in Toronto, in our community. Everybody's talking about how we need to strengthen our commitment, the way we pray, the way we act inside the four walls of the synagogue. Like Rabbi Ovadia said, Rabbi Ovadia said when there's a call, it's outside. The phone shouldn't be on, on vibrate even. And Bezrat Hashem, you're going to see that the rabbis are not going to answer a text. We're going to be totally in the zone, Bezrat Hashem. When we come back, we have to show Hashem that we missed Him. This all wasn't for nothing. That we're not going to walk out of shul in the middle to do whatever. Some people only come two hours a week. Are you going to now take a newspaper, like was mentioned before by one of the rabbis? Or are you going to walk out for a kiddush club? Or are you going to go out to shmooze or this? Come and pray. You need it. And if you don't need it, B'nai Israel needs it. Everybody talks about chesed. Everybody wants to do chesed and kindness to others. One of the greatest chesed's, as all of our tefillah is always in plural. It's in plural because we're praying for everyone as well. You want to do chesed? Pray for B'nai Israel. We need it. We need every single tefillah. Sometimes it might be too enormous to take upon the entire tefillah. We have to try. But there's definitely parts especially the parts that we did not say at home when we were at home now. Kriyat HaTorah, Chazarat HaShatz, Kaddish, Kedusha. These are very, very important times. The time Pedichat HaEchal. Unfortunately, many of these times are times when we fall and talk. The Yitzhak puts more pressure on it. Maybe that's why we were kicked out. We did tefillah. We put on tefillin. We said to Philip, we weren't able to read the Torah. We weren't able to do Petichat Ha'echal and say the Mishaberachs and be there beside the Sefer Torah. We weren't able to do Chazarat Ashats. Maybe it's these pieces that we have to stress even more. Maybe we have to look at our neighbors where we sit at shul and say, you know what, my dear friend, go over to your friend and say, I love you, man. You know, we weren't kicked out of shul for no reason. Let's do it for the both of us. Let's maybe separate ourselves. Let's move over here, move over there so we can pray properly. We can pray better. We both need it. Everyone needs tefillah. You know what else you could do? Pray for yourself. Ask Hashem, Hashem, it's difficult for me. How do we start the Amidah? Hashem, sefatai, tiftach, ufiyagiti, latech. Hashem, open my mouth. Let me pray to you. Hashem, please help me stop talking. Pray for it. 
There's a great worldwide campaign, stopthetalking.org. I encourage you to check out the website. There's so many great rabbis that speak and have videos of great encouragement, inspiration to keep us going with regards to the talking in shul. Two more points before I end. Rabbi Yosef alluded to this. The rabbinic together, we came up with a little idea that could hopefully give an encouragement to the kahal. There's a form that Rabbi Yosef has shared or is going to be sharing to everyone here. We could pass it on, of course. A form taking upon ourselves. A Kabbalah, Lineder, taking upon ourselves to not talk in shul. We're going to sign that form. We're going to send it back. We're going to write our name. We're going to write a name of a loved one that we want to be prayed for. Or even someone that passed away. And the Rabbanim are going to pray for this group. We're going to pray for this group, and there's other Shem. This group's going to continue and to flourish and to spill over to others. Each, each and every friend is going to help each other and group together and band together to make sure the way it should be. So I urge you to take a look at the form, to fill it out, to take it upon yourself, to push yourself to the next notch. I want to end with the following point. In the years 1648 and 1649, the Jewish nation in Eastern Europe faced one of the greatest unfortunate tragedies in our history with the Ukrainian Cossacks unfortunately killing over 250,000 Jews. It was something unbelievable. So many orphans so many people displaced, over 100,000 people displaced after that. Whatever was built up in Ashkenazi Jura at the time was totally decimated. And the great rabbi of Yom Tov, Lipa Heller, otherwise known as the Tos of Yom Tov, a great rabbi and leader at the time, survived. He was boggled by why. Why did this happen? Why? What happened? He prayed to Hashem for some sort of answer. And in a dream, it was revealed to him, Dever Tachat Daber. Dever is a plague because of Daber, because of speech. The speech and the Beta Knesset. And the Tosfot Yom Tov took it upon himself to make it his mission. To go around and to talk about it and to encourage. And he wrote a special Misha Berach that I'm fortunate to say, that in our synagogue, we read this Misha Berach in public once a month. It's a special Misha Berach for those that don't talk in shul, that don't talk during Kriyat Torah. So I'd like to end the evening tonight with giving this prayer to us, who Bezrat Hashem are going to take it upon themselves to further and push the envelope more, push ourselves more not to speak. And Bezrat Hashem, the following Misha Berach will be upon us, our children, and all the Dorot. Mi she berach avotenu, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aharon, David, and Shlomo. We ask Hashem, Hashem, the one that blessed our forefathers, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Moshe, and Aharon, David, and Shlomo. Hu yivarech, he, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, shall bless, et kol mi she shomer pivu shono, anybody that guards their mouth and tongue, to anyone that guards their mouth and tongue from speaking during tefillah and from speaking during the reading of the Torah. Hashem shall guard him and protect him from every trouble and misfortune. And from every plague and illness, COVID-19, Hashem shall protect us. And it shall be placed on this person all of the blessings that are written in the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu 
and that are written in the books of the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim. banim chayim v'kayamim. And he shall merit to have children that are alive and thriving. And he shall merit to raise his children with Torah, with marriage, and with good deeds. And we will merit to serve Hashem, our God, always with truth and with innocence. Amen. It shall so be Hashem's will. And to that we answer, Amen. Thank you very much. Hazaku Baruch. It was an unbelievably powerful finishing to the evening. Thank you, Rabbi Azulai, for such beautiful, beautiful words. Thank you all. Just uh, before concluding, uh, please, if you can take a look at the chat section, which I've disabled. Now you will see the form is available. I just pasted, I pasted it twice. And in the form, you will have an opportunity to see, we wrote a short paragraph explaining what it's for, and we encourage people to sign up and to make a commitment, Bedi Neder, without a Neder, but to make a commitment that the Bet HaKnesset during the time of Tefillah will be placed that is dedicated solely for Tefillah, that we will not, we will not, we will try to increase in the Kiddushah by not talking idle talk during the time of Tefillah. I just want to take this time once again to thank uh, Isaac Oziel for uh, working to put this event together. Hazaku Baruch. I'd like to thank, uh, a heartfelt thanks to our illustrious Rabbanim Hashubim, to Rabbi Zrihen, to uh, Rabbi Zrihen who spoke so eloquently and beautifully about the importance of Tefillah B'Sibur, praying in a minyan, to the illustrious Rabbi Habusha who spoke about the concept of leaving the Hamor outside the Bet HaKnesset, anything that is material and physical outside the Bet HaKnesset, that's the importance of leaving your smartphones outside the Bet HaKnesset, to Rabbi Kadosh who spoke so strongly about the importance of attitude and mindset and the importance of coming early towards tefillah. And finally, a Harun Aharon Chaviv to Rabbi Azulai who courageously took on one of the difficult challenges of speaking, talking, idle talk in the shul. We say amen to his Mishaberach as was mentioned before. We are not asking anybody to do things that we ourselves are not going to try to live up to. So it is our commitment to live up to each one of these things that we mentioned. Just one final point that I would like to make is that somebody asked, somebody has been chat, uh, on the chat about protocols. The event tonight was not really to discuss protocols about re-entering. For that, you have to contact, contact your own synagogues and each synagogue has put together uh, safety protocols for re-entry into our Bet HaKnesset. So for that, you should contact your synagogues. And um, once again, you'll take a look at the form. Rabotai, I just want to end off the evening by saying like this. It was always believed for generations and generations that the Sephardic synagogues were places where they were very, very careful not to talk in synagogues. I know this growing up in an Ashkenazi environment as my uh, esteemed colleagues, we all grew up in Ashkenazi yeshivot, and I remember hearing that it was believed firmly that in the Sephardic synagogues of the world, people did not speak in the synagogues, and they always said that to us. We are trying, what we are trying to do is to bring back the crown to its former glory, to bring back those days, those days when the Sephardic synagogues shown throughout the world as places where there was an extreme awareness and an unbelievable reverence and respect for the Kedushah of the Beit HaKnesset. This is what this is about, to try to increase the awareness. To know every single person that takes that step, not only is it good for themselves, but it has an impact on their neighbor, on the person next to it. If you have a person sitting next to you who knows that you have taken it upon yourself not to talk in the Beit HaKnesset, you can be guaranteed that that person will consider doing the same. And before we know it, Azat Hashem, in the synagogues of Toronto, in the Sephardic synagogues of Toronto, it will be known that these are places of serious tefillah, where we park our donkeys outside, where we come in early, where we don't talk, when we're not supposed to talk, when we participate in tefillah b'tzibur, Azat Hashem, these mikdash, these mikdash me'ats, 
that we are fortunate to have that very, very soon, Ba'azat Hashem, may we be zokhe, once again, to be reunited in Kibetibet Tefillah Yikareh Lechola Amin, the great place of Tefillah. Bimhera, Biamenu, Amen. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Shabbat Shalom, Mvorach, Hatzlacha Rabbah, and may we be zokhe to see Betzorot Tovot. Amen. Thank you all.